Star. Hello and welcome to this edition of Dr. Clark Reports. I'm your host, Dr. Gary Clark, and my friend is Dr. Mona, my, my guest is my friend, Dr. Mona Lisa Saloy, who is a professor of English and coordinator at Dillard University. Greetings and welcome, my friend. Thank you. Yes, Happy you, to be here. Yes, my friend and colleague, should I say. <laughs> Outstanding Thank you. colleague. And, Thank you. And uh, Dr. Saloy, you are, you are author, folklorist, educator, poet, uh, all of these hats that you wear. But let's begin with, with the first hat that you wear as a professor of English and coordinator at, uh, at Dillard University. How, how does that work? Well, we, I, as a coordinator, yes. literally coordinate our activities. That is, educating young people, coordinating the faculty, our adjuncts, so that we have a program that moves, first of all, that really builds a strong foundation on communication skills, critical thinking, reading skills and especially communication and writing skills but we move students beyond that foundation to work for truth and the greater good truth and the greater good oh yes now you know as an English professor I know that uh, that you you can take students and then you can move them from from the baseline all the way up to the area of creativity yes. uh, how's that does that process work when you when a young freshman comes in a youngster comes in in that first level and then when you begin to see a gift or a skill in them it it is a process yes often we meet students first time we still as black people in America have too many firsts firsts in higher education first in many fields and so we get students who may come to you with their head down they're afraid to look at you they're insecure about their skills maybe their skills aren't great then some are very skilled so we get a real mixed bag we get students from the highest in the middle and some at the lower and some are great in math but not so great in communication because they're shy or they're just focused on the science and they don't read other things so we have to turn them on to reading first and make them understand that reading enriches your life and that that's how you begin to think more and really apply yourself. And English itself is so valuable because it it prepares you for so many other disciplines when you get into graduate and professional right. schools. Is that not so? Yes, and in every field, writing, reading, communication is essential. You have to be a critical thinker, which means you have to be a good reader. You have to be able to solve problems, so it means you have to analyze. All of that is part of the critical thinking process, part of communication, whether written or oral. Yes, and um, and so to recognize, I like what I like there. The key word for me is critical, and when critical, and you, they learn how to be a critical thinker. They learn how to be a crit, a critic. Yes. And and I guess in your field, uh, that's essential. It's essential. Now, uh, now I know that um, at the university. And, and, and you do so much at the, at the university. But the one thing that I do like that you do as well is that you mentor individuals. And that mentorship, for my view and audience, will you tell them why that is, that is so important, the mentorship and developing protégés and moving individuals along the pathway to their success? Again, they may not know which way to go. So we give them practical experience. We point the direction. I was mentored. So I have to at least do the great job that great in professors did for me. I would not have this life if my sister hadn't forced me into college. <laughs> I went kicking and screaming. And then really giving me permission. It, this is OK. You can do this. And having that encouragement, but actually imparting skills and giving people practical experience, letting them apply what they learn. Now, you are also, uh, beyond that and your university life, you're also a, an author and a, and a folklorist. As a folklorist, will you tell us how does that work? Folklore, Define that for us. Well, folklore is the human history, like literature. Literature tells the stories, but folklore is all those customs and traditions of people. So it's the real people. For example, everything from foodways to building trades to dancing to the way we speak our proverbs, our stories, our beliefs, and those practices that we do on a regular basis. In New Orleans, it might be masking at Mardi Gras. It might be processions to the Blessed Mother at a certain time of year in May. It might be the second line. So it's those traditions that we learn outside of institutions 
that are passed on by word of mouth, face to face, generation to generation. So there's a certain amount of, of ritualism in, in, in what you see yes. and what you do. Yes, and constancy. In other words, culture cannot happen without the consistency of a people in a place over time. So traditions are developed and revered and passed on and celebrated continuously. Now, I know that uh, your area, a part and parcel to your area of specialty is you, you look at Louisiana culture, South Louisiana culture, and, and in general, you also look at Creole culture. And we, for those who are who are listening to us and viewing this, um, tell them about the nature of, that, of those, that, those areas that you center on. All right, my specialty is contemporary Creole culture, but just a little background oh, on yes. the, the term, which is loaded. First of all, it's a word that's about 600 years old, invented by the Portuguese to describe those mixed natives of enslaved Africans in the, born in the New World. So technically, every black person in America that's mixed in a descendant of an enslaved African is a Creole. The difference is in the South that we share a Francophone Creole culture with about 60 million black people in the Caribbean, South America, and throughout the South. So it's pretty consistent. We do Mardi Gras, we do church. So faith, language, and culture has kept us very consistent from Trinidad to Florida, from New Orleans to Puerto Rico. So that Creolized culture, and it came to us from the Caribbean because after the direct importation of slaves, many people came from Haiti, and we've always been an international port. So we brought with us those Africanisms. For example, I've heard many tour guides talk about the Creole houses. They never say shotgun, but the shotgun house is a West African longhouse that was built on the field with high ceilings, front to back, at planting time and harvest time. And we imported that to plantations in the Caribbean, and from the Caribbean we imported that to New Orleans. So really the shotgun house is a Creole house brought to us by enslaved Africans, of course embellished by our master craftsmen. Precisely. And so that's part of that transmission. And, and so, and, the, and I like the fact that you look at the, at the contemporary aspect of it. So you, you, keep, you, you keep the culture itself relevant. Yes. And, and you understand the relevance of the culture as, as it exists. And th when you go and you, and you do your poems and, and your poetry and your readings and your lectures, and the, what, is, what is the response when you go into, into different arenas around the country? When it, and what becomes a, the central question that they ask you after they feel your, the energy from your work, but what becomes some of the central questions that they may ask you? Well, they're curious because there's a lot of information about colonial Creoles. But who are these people and what happened to them? Well, here we are, you and I. Oh, yes. So we are still here celebrating our traditions, continuing that sense of excellence that we do about everything whether it's cooking or music, <laughs> that improvisational nature that is essentially us. So people ask a lot of questions. I can't come up with one, but one. Improvisational, yes. Yes, improvisation. Well, they say, but it's Creole, but it's different, but I hear it, they hear it, they recognize something. And the interesting thing, I've read my work around the country and places in the Caribbean, even in Europe, and as a matter of fact, I was featured in an international Creole magazine in Britain and there's a huge Creole community. They spell it like the Haitians with a K. But it's recognized that we are descendants of enslaved Africans who have con perpetuated and continued this culture. There's a lot of similarities. If I read my work in New York or California, there's just like Africa, there's no monolithic black culture, even in the mother fatherland. But there's a lot of things we agree on and people recognize those things. You're, you're absolutely, absolutely correct. And I know you, and you make reference to African-American toasting tradition and African-American Creole talk. Yes. Can you reference that for us? Well, here we actually, and we were in a way like immigrants where your parents don't want you to talk that talk. They want you to speak standard American English. Precisely. But we still learned it. So we, we may not speak it fluently, but we do use many phrases still. For instance, somebody told me about that gossip, we say machuquette. <laughs> There's other kinds of phrases. And every time we say hey now, it's New Orleans for hi. We, there's phrases that we use that are essentially making groceries. That's from the French. 
for fair to make. Precisely. You don't make groceries. Precisely. You Precisely. Go. So those kinds of things are inherited from the Creole. Interesting point of note, Sidney Bechet in his autobiography talks about how musicians in a jam set, they used to say when it was good, it was beaucoup, beaucoup, <laughs> beaucoup, man. So, but a lot of English people heard it as cool. And so that's one of the ways cool, so cool developed out of saying beaucoup. So when they said beaucoup, it was fine, it was good, it, which means technically too much or too good, but they, beaucoup. Oh, yes, but they heard yes, cool. Yes. And so cool came out of that. And my uncle, who was a, who played stride piano, Herbert Fitch, he talked about that. No, that's, that's from us. They thought and, we were saying And you recognize beaucoup. it, and you see it, yes, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. And again, and the improvisational uh, aspect of it that you speak about exists with, with musicians. Right. Uh, and the call and, the call and response also mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the churches. And when, they, when you find uh, great uh, orations, you find yes. that call and response here. And, and that works. And you know, uh, you brought with us some of your work, and, and I know I've, I've got to hear some of your, your, if you can do a reading for us, Great. Um, so that uh, my, my audience can hear. Okay. Yes. The first section in the book is called See You in the Gumbo. And that comes from our, no, our, our way of living in the present. People ask me all the time around the country, how can you live there? You know the hurricane season's coming. How do you manage that? Well. We have a lot in common with black people all over the world. A similar worldview, God, family, community. And through that, one, we have faith. So we don't worry about disaster. We live in the now. And that's one of the reasons why people are attracted to New Orleans, because we're friendly, we're outgoing. We don't worry about what's coming next. We can enjoy the day and appreciate it. So instead of huddling fear <laughs> to the hurricanes, we say, see you in the gumbo. <laughs> so that's the title of this first section in Second Line Home, my new book, and the first poem. I'll share that with you. It'll give you a sense of what I mean. And there's music in it. Soon as humidity rears its head mid-May, we smell the rainy season coming. Gotta get out the grill, stoke some coals, braise some shrimp, soak some red beans, steam that rice, and enjoy galleries, yards, and back porches. Party with the DJ spinning Johnny Adams. Tell it like it is. Dance like nobody's there. Dance like nobody's there. Spring spreads aphids on roses. Something about the morning mist. A kiss to every blade of grass and iris bud. Graduations grow like mushrooms in spring. By Memorial Day, backyard barbecues rise like the sun beaming everywhere. Folks don't make no never mind about June 1st, hurricane hype from TV weather watchers. Just count flashlights, candles in jars, canned tuna, peanut butter, water, water bottled, jugged, stacked in cases, party with family crooners, dance like nobody's there, dance like nobody's there. Atlantic and Gulf waters stir for swirls. Daily news broadcasts brace for tropical storms turning into hurricanes. Hurry now, stack up on supplies. Storm warnings rise like cream and cafe au lait. Folks don't make no never mind about hurricane season starts. We joke about Hurricane Betsy, whose waters flow down streets like a parade with floating bodies of dogs, cats, people, shrimp, swollen, stinky. We party. Shake off the cold of fear with the DJ spinning, spinning Joe Jones. You talk too much, you worry me to death. You talk too much, you even worry my pet. Dance like nobody's there. Dance like nobody's there. Gas up the car, pack emergency lights, shout, see you in the gumbo, see you in the gumbo. Dance like nobody's there. See you in the gumbo. Oh, that's beautiful. That is so outstanding. <laughs> I see. You. I see exactly why you were uh, why you were honored as the best female for the, the National Council of Black Artists. Why the best female artist there? Mm -hmm. I can see that. Thank why you. why that level is there, Thank and you. that level of love that you get from from your contemporaries and those individuals who who understand the work and the energy that you put into your work. Mm -hmm. And again, I would like to remind my viewing audience. I'm Gary Clark, and I'm speaking with, with my friend, Dr. Mona Lisa Solari, who's a PhD. She's an author, folklorist, and educator here at Dillard University here in the city of New Orleans. And 
Dr. Saloy, my good friend, I've known you for oh so many years. I know you're a native of the city, but will you pre please tell my viewing audience the Mona Lisa Saloy story? <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you for asking. I'm born and raised in New Orleans in the historic Seventh Ward. The Seventh Ward is in the center of the city from the river, originally from the river to the lake between Esplanade Avenue and Elysian Fields. Now, subsequent city councils and mayors have chopped it up into smaller areas, but that's the historic Seventh Ward. So, for instance, Tootie Montana, the, one of the great big chiefs who taught almost everybody who's still masking, that's elder. He lived in the Ninth Ward, but he lived in the Seventh Ward, and then he moved around the Seventh Ward. So people tend to move around, so they recognize those wards, because that's the way Monsieur Poget, Pauger, laid out the city like a pie. So each rung of the pie spreads out. So people tend to move around the city. But in the Seventh Ward, we have a tradition of excellence, of building trades. For example, when the State Museum next door to the St. Louis Cathedral burned. Remember that? Yes. Who replaced that roof with joint and pin construction? No nails. With aged cypress, Creoles from the neighborhood, the Pujol family. They're cousins of my cousins. <laughs> <laughs> people here, people they always say, when well, there's so many degrees of separation in New Orleans, there's two. <laughs> so we have that, that sense of excellence we, many musicians, Joe Jones, I mentioned in my poem, Alan Toussaint lives in the, in the Seventh Ward Technique. John Scott was from the Seventh Ward. So we have this tradition of excellence in everything you do. I heard as a child, you come into a room, you make it better. Yes. And everything you do has to be that way. And we do it that way because otherwise you have to do it again. And what schools did you, did you go to? Epiphany Catholic School and then to Xavier Prep. For two years till my mom passed and then I went to Joseph S. Clark so I'm a proud bulldog <laughs> <laughs> and then I left to visit my sister and wanted to stay she said you have to go to college but I have this huge family network so I did undergraduate at the University of Washington then my first graduate degree is at San Francisco State University and then I returned home to deepen my work and I ended up doing a Master of Fine Arts at LSU and then the PhD. And I wanted to continue my research then on Bob Kaufman, that's one of my books coming, <laughs> which was my dissertation. He is a Creole from the Seventh Ward, lived right across from McDowell number 19. And his family, they listened to opera, they had dinners together, and his parents, his father worked at the Boston the exclusive Boston Club as a waiter, and he ran away and joined the Merchant Marines. But he was right there with Ginsburg and, Al, and Allen Ginsburg and Jack Kerouac. So he was the black beat guy. Oh, yes. He took them into the Negro streets at dawn. <laughs> and he, there's a great cult around him. He's revered all over the world, especially in Europe. But he's born from right here. Most people don't know that story. So I came home to finish that work, and then my father took ill, so I did that. And then I came to Dillard, and I found another family. Oh, yes. Dillard has been a wonderful experience for me because the scholars there, the presidents, and I've had several presidents because I've been there a while, but they all, again, have that sense of excellence and that expectation that we educate this next generation. And so through my colleagues like you, I found a wonderful family of support for my own intellectual pursuits. Well, your um, influences, personal and professional, who are they? Personal, I think my parents and my uncles and aunts. I think my, my Uncle Herb and my mother's little brother, he laid bricks and was cement finisher by day and musician by night. And my father could have been an architect. He could build anything. He did electrician work, he did plumbing, but mostly designing boxes for new equipment for the Army. So they build a new machine, and he designed a box. Never lost a nail, never needed an extra nail or extra piece of wood. And when they forced him to retire in his early 70s, they hired a young architect. They lost more in the first three months than they paid my dad in a year. Amazing. And so that, that level of 
of just attention to detail, of expertise. My mother sang. She was the rock of the family. She kept everybody together. And all, there was always cousins living with us. And so my cousins are like brothers and sisters to me. It was just a wonderful way to grow up. Well, uh, you know, uh, what is it that, uh, that really stimulated you to be involved and, and to take your work and be so external with it? To, to carry it beyond the city and to carry it uh, around the world. What, what, what stimulated you to do that? I first wrote to remember. I was in a car accident. I married very young. It didn't work. <laughs> and I, we had a car accident six months after we were married, and that left me with no memory, a hole in my lung. They told me I'd never walk again. By the grace of God, here I am. <laughs> and I literally wrote to remember and met writers. And they said, wow. Who's Marie Laveau? And what's with all this new, I was in Seattle. What's with all this New Orleans stuff? So they took me to their teacher, Colleen McElroy, who became my mentor. And she groomed me into this life as a writer. And so I was always interested in folklore and literature at the same time. And this was after the black arts movement. So I grew up inheriting that consciousness and understood that this was larger than me. That And as I read the great work of Langston Hughes and Alice Walker and Sonia Sanchez and Amiri Baraka, the New Orleans voice was not there. Precisely. And I wanted our sweet stories and our neighborhood traditions documented. And so that just, I just kept following my nose. And I won contests all along the way. I worked in publishing which allowed me never to starve. <laughs> and that's why I tell my students, you want to be an artist, get a day job that you like. <laughs> and that and works. It does, it works. And so you, I get to be creative. I steal minutes and because I, uh, teaching is a, a great responsibility. And for those of us who are true educators like yourself, we spend a lot of time keeping current, looking for the best ways to entice our students to just love learning and to affect change for, in their own lives, their families and their communities, and then the world. So that we take that responsibility very seriously. So that engulfs us with a lot of time and then we do service, but I have to do this. This is not about me, this is not about, and it is, but it's, it's about all of us. And, right, that becomes uh, the needed and the necessary in terms of what you do. Yes. And the challenge in folklore, literature, what's the, what is the challenge right now that you see in terms of getting the message out, getting the, uh, creating and maintaining the audience, yes? In literature, the interesting thing, especially in black literature, black American literature, so long we were fought for freedom. And then so long we fought to get our identity. I mean, we were, we were enslaved, we were Negroes, we were colored, we were all these things. Then we were black, then we were African American. And now there's an intellectual split. Where's the tradition? Because now people feel like they're just American. Is this really a post-racial society? Well, we've seen that it is not. But, right. so I have to do what is true for me. And artists, if an artist is true to their art, that's what they have to do. So the challenge is, are you writing in the tradition or are you just doing your own thing and you don't really care about your culture? And you, but if that's what you know, how can it really resonate with what we call verisimilitude, that semblance of truth? Now in folklore, for me the challenge is to document contemporary Creole culture before so many of our elders pass because it has changed, that is it has evolved, it's not dead. It's just evolved. So I want to show that evolution. We know where we were, but how do we get to where we are today? And where might we go tomorrow? Well, uh, and, and you're right in terms of that. And, and that, uh, to get us to this particular point in view and to get us to where we need to be. Uh, I, I like your approach toward it. I, I like how you, uh, how you try and, and blend, blend everything together. And, and it works real well. Now, you. your students do you see them coming into the same vein yes I've had very I'm thankful very successful students one just returned Nicole Perkins she's a young poet she won a national prize she wasn't even in the Iowa program she was in the the master's program but she won the MFA prize and so Jericho Brown another Dillard grad 
He won the $50,000 Whiting Prize in New York City. His book, Please, is just making all kind of noise. It's wonderful. Sadiq Ali was on Deaf Poetry Jam, Saturday Night at the Apollo. He's in books and anthologies, and so are many of my other students. They've won prizes in playwriting as well as poetry. So, I'm, and they're working at publishing companies and are writing for a living. Naya Wilson has her own public relations firm here in New Orleans. Naita Wilson, I'm just so proud of her. So many, many of my students, and they write to me and they let me know, oh, I know what you were talking about. <laughs> I'm using this. <laughs> and one recent graduate, she has her own writing firm. She assists people with putting all kind of documents together, and she's in California. So many, many, many successful students, so I'm very well, thankful. Well, you see, and, and that becomes the joy in terms of what you do, not to, to, to not only uh, spread your word, but to have individuals who hold service protégés and go out there and and they can also get this message out of uh, folklore itself and, and, and have it accepted uh, within the community. And uh, I, I think that uh, in your approach toward this, uh, one of the questions that comes to my mind, and, and I know within the main, remaining two minutes that we have, one of the questions that comes to my mind is one that says that when you write and you do your work, and I know sometimes you may want to pair it with, uh, with visuals, is it difficult to find the right graphic artist <laughs> or, or the right person that can give you the visual of your word? We have two minutes remaining, yes. All right. In my first book, I, I contracted Louisiana Jones, a folk artist. He passed away, sadly, a year and a half ago. But his work, a folk artist, self-taught. Can may I show his the cover? Oh, yes, we know. We're not, we're not promoting the book, book but, but we can see that. Yes. Yeah, it's a, a second line. It's so beautiful. And when I saw that, I said, this is it. This is Red Beans and Ricely Yours. It is. And for my new book, Second Line Home, I wanted to capture how much heart we have, coming back to nothing, literally, with food deserts, rebuilding one wall, one roof at a time. And I saw the fabulous work of a brother from the neighborhood, Richard C. Thomas, a fine artist from New Orleans. And as a matter of fact, the young man who, his name escapes me, who did the poster for Jazz Fest this year, Richard C. Thomas Osborne. was oh Osborne. Yes. Richard was his teacher. And when I saw this work, it's three women of New Orleans, three mothers of New Orleans. It just says that. There's the second line, there's the homes, there's the women. And so when people see ten thousand books on a shelf, you want beautiful art to entice them to open it. I feel if they open it, I have them, but that beautiful art, it's tough because books are well designed, but beautiful fine art. Yes, yes, yes. I want to thank you. It was absolutely <laughs> you. wonderful. And again, I want to thank um, my viewing audience for tuning in, and this is Dr. Clark Reports, and as always, it's been a pleasure.